Welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us on this uh, webinar slash hangout chat time uh, about observability and reliability in deep systems. Um, as you've joined, if you have at any time, if you think of questions you want to start to interact, we do have the chat available for you. So feel free to, to talk in the chat. If you've got any questions for Ben or for Colton or myself, feel free to drop those in the Q&A. The Q&A in your interface should look like a little uh, couple of comic or dialogue bubbles it says Q&A, but we'll have questions there. As you jump into that, uh, feel free to upvote other people's questions. So if someone asks a question that you like or you'd like to see answered, feel free to upvote that. Uh, if you have to leave at any point, don't feel bad. I know that we're all remote and we're all dealing with a lot of stuff. And for those of us uh, who have worked in engineering, if you're on call, you may get called away on something. Hopefully not. That's why we're talking about reliability. But if you do, we are recording this session. So uh, don't, don't feel bad about having to leave. You can always catch up later. With that, I'd like to kick things off and I'll start with, uh, with Colton. Colton Andrus is the CEO and co-founder of Gremlin aka my boss. Um, so Colton, uh, as an introduction, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself and about your history and why reliability is so so important to you. Thanks, Jason. I actually just got paid, so I got to go. I uh, hope you all understand. Goodbye. No, just kidding. Um, as Jason mentioned, uh, Colton Andrus, CEO, co-founder of Gremlin. Before that, engineer by trade. Uh, I spent some time at Amazon. I worked on their availability team. So it was our job to make sure the website didn't go down. We handled the call leader program. We handled the incident management and the postmortems. We also built tooling and went and helped teams go uncover issues and fix their systems. After that, I went and joined Netflix. Uh, this was right after Netflix had first spoken about Chaos Monkey. And so it was an exciting time. We had the cultural buy-in. I ended up on a team really in charge of the API, the proxy. When we went down, Twitter was alive, customers were upset. And one of the things we found is that there was a lot of opportunity to lean in on the KS engineering side and really make the systems more reliable, going from three nines to four nines, making more time for our teams, being paid 25% less, and ultimately just better understanding and having more trust and confidence in our systems. So having seen it be an important part of Amazon and Netflix success, I felt like this is something that everyone was going to need as they adopted microservices, as they moved to the cloud, or as we're going to talk about today, are building these complex, deep systems that truly are, are a challenge to operate. Thanks. Now I'll turn it over to Ben. Ben's the CEO and co-founder of Lightstep. So Ben, tell us a little bit more about yourself and Particularly then, lay the, the foundation, what are deep systems? Sure, thanks Jason. Um, and I'm excited to be here with uh, Colton too. Uh, I'm, I wish Colton was my boss, that sounds fun. Look at that background, it must be exciting. Um, I, I was, uh, uh, my bad background for me, I was at Google for um, my formative years out of school. I was there for a little longer than I probably should have been. I stayed for nine years, I think the first six or seven were pretty awesome. And then by the end of that, I felt like I really wanted to do something of my own, which I'm now doing. But I, I spent the majority of my time at Google working on what we would now call observability. Um, I was, um, I led the team that brought uh, Dapper, which is Google's distributed tracing system into production there. And uh, I helped to write the paper about that. And then I, um, I created a team to do um, large scale time series monitoring. So what we would now call metrics and built Google's multi-tenant uh, metrics infrastructure as well called Monarch, um, which I believe there actually is a paper being written that should be published this year. Although, unfortunately, since I don't work there, I didn't get to work on it at all, but um, I'm excited to see it. Um, I uh, left Google and uh, much like Colton felt like there were things that um, Google had done well that I wanted to try to bring to the larger market. And then there are also things I I wish we'd done differently that I, I wanted a, a new a second crack at. So part of this for me is just, I, I love the space. I think um, for better or worse, um, we're still very early uh, in our journey as an industry to properly observe our systems and feel like we understand them. And, and to me, um, it's just a fascinating problem to spend my career on. So I've been working on this stuff for about 15 years uh, and plan to continue doing it as long as I can find a way to 
um, to you know feed my children while I'm at it. Um, so let me. Um, I did have a probably a five minute deck just to set the stage on deep systems um, and and what that actually means and to motivate some of it. And I think um, we can jump from there into um, into a conversation that Jason will lead. Um, but I'll present this. So, what are deep systems and why should I care? So this is um, this is extracted and um, somewhat uh, polished from a uh, talk I did uh, last year at, at, at QCon, um, uh, but I've just tried to extract the part about deep systems themselves because when we talk about microservices, uh, I don't mind the term, I think it's okay, but it's um, the problems that we're having, it's not about the individual services, it's about the way that they're arranged and constructed, and, and that's really what I'm gonna be talking about here. So uh, there are two types of scaling. One type of scaling is scaling wide. So um, in the natural world, one thing that scales wide is water. If you have a little bit of water, you get a puddle. And if you add a lot more water, water you just get a really big puddle. And there are a lot of things in life um, that scale this way, where you add more and you just get a bigger version of what you started with. Um, and I could come up with many examples of that. And there are some examples from software as well. Um, things that are considered embarrassingly parallel, often scale wide, um, like MapReduces and cache server pools and things like that. Um, then there's uh, stuff that scales deep. And um, uh, in a system that scales deep, here we'll talk about uh, a cohabitation. So this is a village that probably houses, I don't know, I can't count very well, but let's say you know, 20, 50 people, something like that. As you add more people to a village and it becomes a town and a city and then a metropolis, you don't just get a, a bigger village, you get something really different structurally. And for me, uh, looking at the systems that we're building um, the, with microservices, the question is, do microservices scale wide or do they scale deep? And, uh, and this is something I actually didn't know the answer to. I knew that at Google, we had very deep systems, but I didn't know how things were in the larger industry when we started LightStep. Uh, and I, I've gotten a much better sense of that just from looking at our customers' data in the aggregate. Um, so one way things could work is uh, scaling wide. So here's a, uh, an example of what that might look like. Again, I think there are examples of this in software. Some software systems do scale wide where you just add more servers and you get more uh, instances of a service and that's that. Um, but maybe there's also a software that scales deep where um, the services are arranged in many layers with each um, layer um, offering a, an intentional point of abstraction behind an API, um, but in that, in that process, obscuring what comes below it. And the question I had was, well, what is it? You know, if you look at customers that are adopting microservices, do they tend to have this hub and spoke model where they scale wide or do they tend to scale deep? Um, and so I, I picked um, really almost at random four customers at LightStep and um, blurred out the service names and just took a, a, a screenshot of the basic service diagram that they have. Um, and here's one um, where they have about, I think, 20 services. And you can see um, that uh, there's uh, actually two separate subsystems within their architecture. One is about three levels deep, and the other is, um, yeah, at least uh, six or seven levels deep. Um, if we go to a system that has five uh, layers of infrastructure, um, you can see that, uh, sorry, they have that have 50 services, they've got almost, I think, nine levels of depth in their system. And these are the dependencies between uh, services and what comes below them. Uh, when we go to 100, 200 services, I couldn't get it all to be on a screen at once because it was so deep. And when we get to um, 2,000 services, which is, you know, uh, I don't, I don't like the term web scale, but, you know, uh, uh, these are name brand consumer services that have huge scale then it's almost ridiculous. I mean, um, there's, this visualization is almost impossible and the level of depth is similar to what we saw at Google where even a, a cache miss on web search, which is actually a relatively simple service since it's mostly read-only, um, would often be 25, 30 levels deep before you got to the bottom of the stack. Uh, so in, in my mind, this is quite convincing that microservices at scale are not just wide systems, they're deep systems. And with each layer of depth, there's the opportunity for um, miscommunication and misunderstanding, which um, can lead to no end of interesting, uh, like multi-year efforts around reliability and observability, which is why these things have become such hot topics in recent years. Um, 
So there's this architectural transformation that's happening uh, across the industry. This is largely driven by a desire to develop software faster. The idea is that um, we're moving from uh, having fewer services with lots of developers per service to teams that can operate with more independence and more services. Um, at the top, you have a pure monolithic architecture and then deep systems um, become more prominent as you get into having dozens of services. And certainly once you get to hundreds, I think it's inevitable. Uh, and this, um, you'll, you'll know what it sounds like from your organization. You'll hear things like this, um, like you have a P0 issue and you can't find the one principal engineer who knows where all the bodies are buried. Um, that's a sign that um, people are not able to self-serve to understand what's going on. Um, you have a lot of finger pointing where you'll have a, a two teams that are diagnosing an issue that somehow involves their two services and they both claim correctly that their dashboards look about right and they can't figure out where the issue is. Um, you'll have people saying that the risk is too high to even expect a single day remediation for a bad deploy, so you just don't deploy on Fridays. You'll have um, conference bridges with um, 35 people because they're all trying, to, we joke around about MTTI, mean time to innocence, like everyone's just looking for some reason to get off the call, but you need to start with everyone, which is incredibly destabilizing and inefficient. Um, you'll have multi-tenant services, I'm picking on Kafka here, it's really not Kafka's fault, but you'll have multi-tenant services, databases, Kafka, et cetera, will light on fire because one of their many clients upstream had a workload change and they weren't provisioned for it properly. Um, you'll have people discovering they depended on regions they didn't even know um, were online, um, uh, which uh, seems inexcusable, but it's actually quite understandable given the abstractions. Um, and you'll have people who can't even find on the dashboards that they're looking for. So these are all symptoms of the indirection um, that uh, is commonplace and almost intrinsic to the design of, of deep multi-layer uh, systems. Um, the last thing I'll end with here is just really about stress. So um, I shouldn't say it's my favorite, but I think the most concise definition of stress that I've seen is responsibility without control. Um, so if you have a lot of responsibility, but you can't control um, the things you're responsible for, that's intrinsically a very stressful thing. And when you think about deep systems, and you know, here's an abstract diagram of this, if you are one of the people operating this service here, and every service in the middle of the stack has some set of dependencies, whether you manage them or not, um, you are responsible, uh, sorry, you can only control your own service by definition. The whole point of microservices was to have people operate in parallel so you can control your own service but not other people's and you can move quickly. But you are actually intrinsically responsible for everything below you. Um, and this is what makes it so difficult. As you have more and more dependencies, every time there's an issue down stack, that becomes an issue for you. And that's why you'll have, you know, um, alert storms where uh, many teams will get woken up at the same time. And it's a very stressful situation. And uh, this is total pseudoscience, obviously, to draw this on the graph and these axes don't have um, labels and so on. But the, the basic idea is that um, as we add more depth to the system, you don't control any more than you used to. It's still just your service, but your responsibility is at some level uh, proportional to the square of that depth, that whole area of that triangle is what you're responsible for, which is, I think, why things often feel um, so out of control and stressful. And the job that we have to do as operators is to find some way to shrink this gap. And that's really what I was hoping we could talk about today. Um, this is, uh, there are you know, many uh, ways to look at this problem, but what we're trying to do is to move those curves closer together so we can control the things that we're responsible for. Uh, I think that's the end of file. I'm done, um, and I will stop presenting and hand it back to you, Jason. Well, actually, Thanks. maybe yep. if you don't mind keeping that up, and Jason, not to not to co-opt, if you go back to, first of all, I love the definition of, of um, responsibility without control being, being uh, stress. Go back uh, one more. So this slide resonates with me because when I was at Netflix and we owned the API and the proxy, we were <clears throat> the top of that triangle. And when I joined that team, I originally joined Netflix just to be an IC. I wasn't going to focus on chaos engineering. And what happened was my first three months, I sat in on multiple outages that were, you know, oh, an identity service failed or oh, a recommendation service failed or oh, a cache failed down here that cascaded up. But it ultimately became our problem. 
the API service, if we were down, it was our fault. You know, that time to innocence, which, which I also think we can go deep on because that one's super interesting. Um, that time to innocence was critical. And, you know, at the end of the day, if, if a service beneath us failed and we went down, it was our fault. And so this, this surface area was really the motivating factor of working with the mid tier services to help harden them so that their failures, so their failures wouldn't happen as often. This is really actually just, I'll, I'll peel back the layer once more. This is why Hystrix, the circuit breaker pattern was implemented at Netflix because Netflix had a, a fat client model at the time. And so the API was running the client jars for all these mid, mid tier service teams, but those teams wrote the code. And so if they did a, a poor job with error handling, it, it showed up in our VM, it showed up in our service metrics. And, and so that was the motivating factor for how do we create bulkheads? How do we create failure isolation? So one, one set of you know, bad circumstances or code that didn't handle a failure well didn't overwhelm the whole service. So this whole topic to me resonates well. Yeah, well, I think what you mentioned with Hystrix, right? There's this idea that, you know, we can build tools, but ultimately when we look at what Ben was saying, those responses that we get, those are all, you know, whether it's Kafka's on fire or the two teams that are like, my dashboards are okay. I think there's, there's the two solutions, right? There's tools and then there's a cultural piece. You know, we talk about in innocence and blame and things. I'm curious if you could reflect on that, you know, coming from, from Netflix, where, you know, if we think of wide services, it's not really just a movie player, right? Or Amazon isn't just a web store. Um, how does the cultural piece, like how does all of these deep systems impact the culture and how do you help mitigate that with culture? How did you do that at Amazon and Netflix? Culture is an important piece. I think it's one of the necessary but not sufficient pieces to really build reliable systems and have lasting change. We, we describe it internally at Gremlin of you might have a project, but is it part of your practice? And is it treated as a one-off or is everyone on board and, and working toward the same end? At Amazon, there were teams that you know, were in the line of fire, so to speak, that felt this pain that needed very little convincing but it was the teams further down the stack that maybe they hadn't been the cause of an outage. Maybe it was an old service that got handed off to another team and they didn't, in fact, I, I can remember a Black Friday outage for an hour and a half for a, a service that got handed to another team that didn't think it was critical, that didn't scale when it needed to, that, that brought everything down. But that, <clears throat> at Netflix, what was great is people were culturally on board leadership and management were on board. And so we didn't have to fight that battle. And that was to me why we were able to have so much success so quickly, so much improvement. Because when we went and talked to the teams and said, hey, we wanna, we wanna make your life better so your service doesn't fail and you don't get paged. And we wanna make our own lives better. So we're not feeling the effect of that. People understood that that was important, that it was something worth investing in and that it was in their best interest. And I've seen a lot of a lot of companies and teams where if that's not a priority or if they're not bought in conceptually, they treat it as one more thing to do, as one more task to get to, as another technical debt item, and it, it just doesn't get prioritized compared to the other work. Well, I'm curious that Netflix was the SRE organization or whatever they called that function or that set of responsibilities, was that a separate organization or was it, was it kind of melded into the primary engineering organization? That's a, it's another one to, that's interesting to discuss. How do you organize things? So Netflix had a dedicated SRE team. Um, there was kind of a portion of frontline engineers that were in operations folks that were jumping on calls and helping address minor issues and dealing with the, the forefront. And some that were a little more focused on the analysis and the tooling. Um, but those were separate. Like our, our team, we, we had a platform team in charge of the proxy and the API, and we did the majority of our reliability work. And there was always this debate of, can a third party team that doesn't own the software that, you know, maybe they're getting paid for it, maybe they're not, but they may or may not have the access to go fix the things that they find. 
you know, should they be the, it's this debate of ownership. Should you centralize a team because it's more efficient or should you have it that role embedded on, on the team itself, increasing their responsibility. And as you talked about, maybe, maybe increasing their responsibility without increasing their control. And one yeah. thing we debated was, do you like embed the SREs on those teams for a time? And honestly, I have no, I have no easy answers here. Yeah, I don't think they exist. I mean, I would, one of the th when we were, Jason, you were asking about cultural aspects of this, one thing, I, an anecdote that comes to mind from, uh, from my years at Google, actually towards the end, when we were talking about um, bringing Monarch into production. So Monarch was a multi-tenant, uh, was a multi-tenant service, which doesn't sound, maybe, I don't know if that sounds controversial or not, but within Google at the time, that was a controversial thing because it was meant to be very high availability and, and almost as high availability as the scaling, as the scheduling system itself that um, was the most high availability thing that kept everything running. Uh, so multi-tenant and high availability felt scary to people. And I went into a meeting that I won't forget with, I won't say who it was, it's not the point, I'm not trying to disparage anyone, but someone who's senior leadership for um, the overall SRE organization, who I think was understandably nervous about this high availability multi-tenant service or you know, monitoring all of Google or whatever. And I, um, he was very demanding about reliability, which is totally fine, I, I get that. And I, I said, okay, well, listen, let, let's just, let's be pragmatic about this. How many nines do you need from this anyway? And he said, I need 100% reliability, to which, of course, I said, well, that's kind of ridiculous. Like, you can say five nines if you want, but like, at least say, he's like, no, I need 100% reliability. And to me, he knew, he's smart enough to know that that's not possible. But um, to me, the, the actual lesson is that the organizational structure was such that he had no particular reason to ask for anything less than 100%, because the velocity of my project was not his responsibility. And I think if you, regardless of the organizational structure and dotted lines and however you want to do it, embedding teams or not, um, having the development team and the team that's responsible for SRE share both reliability and some form of product velocity objectives to share those is really important. I think, ironically, the team that was embedded SRE for what we were doing, that was very well aligned. But, um, but uh, we, we shared those objectives. But when you had someone who did not share the objective and just saw this as pure risk, I think he didn't have an incentive to um, think about product velocity. So uh, that, that's the anti-pattern I've seen. You, you don't want, you, it's good to have a natural tension, but you, you don't want it to be something where there's no alignment whatsoever um, on both reliability and velocity. And I think that sort of thing can happen very easily in these sorts of systems um, where you, um, when, especially when there's a when, when there isn't some shared dependency or shared objective uh, between um, the, the two parts of the organization. Just to, I, and I, <clears throat> I agree with that skin in the game. The folks, that, the folks that feel the pain have an incentive to make it better. And there's a few ways to align that. <clears throat> but when other folks in the organization aren't aligned, don't feel the pain, but get to tell you how it should work, you, know, you can create that, that lack of alignment. And as I look at this pyramid again, you know, sometimes those teams at the top are given those high goals or those high expectations where the teams underneath them aren't. And sometimes that, I mean, one, there's, we can just discuss about the math behind it. Like if, if all your, if you're, if you're building a service on all three, nine services, you can't have a three, nine service, but there's also that do people understand this relationship? Because I think that goes back to this point of deep systems and understanding those, those interconnected pieces, because they may not realize that they're, they're feeling the same pain you are, or that they're, they're shouldering the same burden that you are. Yeah. I think it's interesting, Ben, that you mentioned at Google, having someone that only prioritizes reliability, particularly because, um, you know, when, back when I worked at O'Reilly, one of the books that we published was the, the Google SRE book, right? Which espoused this idea of setting SLOs and balancing velocity and innovation with reliability. Um, so I'm curious if, if you have any comments on that about, you know, the SRE practice and, and that idea of setting SLOs to, to help maintain this balance. Yeah, I certainly have thoughts about that and some reflections. I mean, first of all, just full disclosure, I left Google and 
uh, in late 2012. So it spent some time, right? Uh, and I believe that book was actually, I think it was published a year or two after I left, but I'm still friends with folks there and in touch with them. And I, I think I have a bit of a pulse on how things are going. Um, um, the S3 organization, and I don't, this is not a critique at all, I think it is actually probably good, um, wasn't something where they had a single best practice that was, that was implemented across the entire company. There certainly were pockets uh, of consistency, uh, but it, there was room for experimentation. And while there were certainly teams that looked um, very much like what was described in that book, and our kind of user research for building uh, uh, Monarch and Dapper, I spent a lot of time with SRE teams that had very different philosophical ideas about the way that SRE should be done. Um, so I don't think that that book actually speaks for the entire organization. For what it's worth, I, I like a lot of the ideas in there, and I think, personally, I think they make a lot of sense. SLOs in particular seem really, really darn important to me, although um, it, the, uh, the writing about them um, tends to understate how hard it is to set reasonable targets. And um, this gets back to what um, Colton was talking about, uh, where if you depend on a 3.9 service, your ability to provide a 4.9 service is, you're starting from a pretty tough place. And you can talk about running multiple queries in parallel and all sorts of tech, uh, techniques that have been described in various places, but um, especially for errors, it's really difficult to, to claw yourself back from those sorts of dependencies. Um, but the thing that's interesting is the other case, which I saw almost as frequently, especially for latency. And um, one of the hidden, you know, it's, I think it's well known that if you want to, to understand tail latency in distributed systems, that some kind of distributed tracing is really important. And if you want to have um, tight latency distributions up a deep stack, you have to think about tail latency. So people often think of distributed tracing as a way to um, optimize. The thing that was actually more interesting to me um, was how distributed tracing was used um, to, uh, to kill projects before they started when they weren't necessary. So SLOs, um, it can be really hard uh, to set SLO targets correctly, but people often do is look at their history and say, well, I'll set it a little bit above my previous high water mark or something like that, because I know we are doing okay over time, especially for latency. When in many cases, what we would see is then a team would be looking for their quarterly project and every engineer loves doing performance work. So they would set a target to move that down by 20% and someone would spend a quarter on that. And what we were able to see with tracing was that um, they were never on the critical path. It literally made no difference. I mean, they could have, they could have been, they could have done a 99% latency improvement and it wouldn't have made any difference because they were never on the critical path to begin with of an actual end user request. And so one of the challenges with SLOs is understanding, um, you know, uh, not just how aggressive, but, but, uh, but not being too aggressive uh, about the targets that you're setting in light of the larger system. Um, this also came up when Google finally started measuring latency from the client in a really principled way and realized that for customers that were in um, countries with poor backbone connectivity, that these Herculean feats people were doing to make backend latency 20% faster were dwarfed by the fact that the critical path for end users, um, even on broadband in some countries, was 90% network. So it's just totally pointless. And that led them to develop entire satellite data centers with their own, you know, Google specific fiber to connect it back to Google's own backbone and other continents and things like that. Um, that sort of analysis, um, it's not intuitive uh, and it requires um, a, a critical path analysis in the aggregate um, across, you know, thousands or millions of requests in order to, to detect those patterns and realize that you shouldn't, um, you shouldn't optimize the thing that's hard necessarily. Sometimes the thing you need to optimize is way at the top of the stack and it's all about CDNs and stuff like that, right? So, so I think we learned a lot of, um, uh, a lot of lessons about um, SLOs um, both being too, uh, not aggressive enough but also being too aggressive uh, when we started to look at latency um, across many levels of the stack. Nice, I, I think that that dovetails nicely into something that Raj asked in the chat about um, Essentially, how does Amazon and Netflix, uh, as Colton, as you were there, you know, there's a high price to pay for those additional nines. And you've talked about this a lot, how it becomes exponentially harder. I think dovetailing with what Ben said about like figuring out where do you optimize, uh, what, how did you do that at Netflix and Amazon? How did you help try to mitigate some of those costs of getting those additional nines? Uh, 
One of the things I observed at Amazon was kind of a, a pendulum effect between efficiency, performance, and reliability as it, as it stood to redundancy. Because a, a, a simple answer to availability might just be throw more hosts at it, and a simple answer to latency and making things fast might be paralyze it and, and add more hosts. But then you get the efficiency bill and your boss is like, wait a minute, how much money did this cost? And so, you know, as Ben alluded to, it's really, it's a balancing act. And I think, I think that the reason Ben and I are here and excited to talk together are on one hand, you have to understand how the system fits together and how it's, how it behaves in the happy case, and you need to understand how that changes when failure occurs. The SLO discussion uh, strikes home to me because um, I've seen so many timeouts be configured by looking at a graph and drawing a line over the top of the graph and saying, well, it worked in the past, so we must be good. And the truth is, it's, it's a fine starting point, but it doesn't actually protect you. It may be too lenient that you know, you should be cutting off the 99th percentile or the 99.9 percentile so that customers are getting a retry or getting a better experience so the system isn't backing up or falling behind. And when things go wrong and queue up and slow down, if you're not being aggressive enough on those SLO, on those timeouts, not SLOs, then you're not able to really protect yourself in the way you expect. Um, a quick tangent, the one thing I've, I've heard recently that I really enjoyed about SLOs, because to me it's always been, are we lowering the bar for ourselves? We should always be you know, prioritizing availability and making it better. And if there are things that are non-critical, like get them out of the path, like gracefully degrade, have a static fallback or a cache so that we don't have to do these complex permutations to, to, to solve that non-critical problem. But SLAs are actually a way for engineering teams to push back on product. Because if you're not meeting your SLO and that's what the business expects, then essentially you have a justification to say to the product team, hey, we can't do all the features you asked this quarter because we're not meeting our SLO. And I'd never thought of it that way. And I felt like that's a powerful tool for engineering managers and teams because sometimes you know, this focus on making things more reliable or better understanding our systems is looked as a nice to have when really it's, it's critical to the operation and, and building quality software. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, having that data in order to push back to get, you know, better reliability. I think having that data, obviously turning back over to Ben requires having some sort of understanding of, of what your reliability is. So I'm curious if you could talk a little bit more about that in terms of like, how do you, you know, you measure, mentioned that SLOs are hard, right? What do you measure? So I'm curious if you can chime in on, so, you know, we need this data, what should we be measuring? Yeah, totally. I, I mean, um, I don't want people to be, um, there's a, there's like SLO 301 class and there's SLO 101 class. and the one-on-one version is really not that complex, right? It's um, think about what the, your clients, whether they're end users or other services need, and uh, mainly in terms of latency and error ratios, and maybe also in terms of what sort of throughput they can expect. And start there and just make sure that you cover those bases. If you can establish that and set reasonable targets based on not just historical performance, what, what your client actually needs to do their job, um, you're, in, you're, you're unfortunately way above, <laughs> above the bar in terms of what's typical right now. So I think the first thing is just not to be intimidated by the super complex version of this and just to establish something reasonable. Um, now, uh, having set SLOs, I guess there's a couple of things I would reflect on um, based on, I don't know, my career of seeing these things go sideways. Um, uh, at some level, this goes back to the, the um, the crutch of looking at historical performance. And I think this does play well into the chaos engineering philosophy as well. You, um, you, you really can't look at the steady state of your system and use that to draw conclusions about how things fit together. Uh, um, that's really important. In fact, the diagrams I generated earlier about the systems, I said I got those from Lightstep. It was actually a little bit of a chore to generate a steady state diagram because we really discourage them in our product. I think it's 
It's a mistake, actually. You should, in my mind, you should be looking at dependencies and execution patterns in the context of a particular type of request. Like you should be able to issue, uh, you should be able to, your observability system, you should be able to say, I want to understand my system when it's doing this activity. So you should say, I'm only interested in, you know, checkout operations, or I'm only interested in this particular customer of ours or something like that. And to be able to understand that execution pattern somewhat in isolation. And then ideally, if you have something like chaos engineering, you can also, you can explore certain hypotheses about important conditional branches within your system. Like what do you do if this entire network region is mysteriously unavailable? Because that will happen at some point. And it's, you know, it's going to be bad, but you don't know how bad unless you can test that hypothesis. So I think for SLOs, it's, um, it's tempting to look at the aggregate steady state data, but the real question is what happens when things aren't going well. Of course, chaos engineering is, is probably the best practice to get ahead of that, and I think that's an incredibly important uh, way to be proactive. From an observability standpoint, um, the, um, the tendency I see in observability tooling is to allow people to explore a single point in time. So you're either exploring the steady state or you're exploring the not so steady state um, but they don't make it easy to understand what changed. And uh, given how unbelievably complex these systems are, I know from my own experience, actually, you, I said earlier that part of LifeStep, it's not about redesigning what we had at Google and, and selling it. It's actually correcting for regrets I have. And a big regret was that we, we did a very good job with some of our tooling at Google and explaining exactly how the system behaved. But the system is so complex that you'd have people during incidents saying, oh my gosh, I found it. This is crazy. And it's like, actually, no, that was totally normal. It is crazy, but it's also normal. And it's really hard to know what is the new crazy thing that's happening versus the many old crazy things that are happening all the time. And so observability, in my mind, it has to focus on a change. So you have to say, this is normal behavior. This is abnormal behavior. Behavior, what is different about these? Not as individual transactions, but in the aggregate, what is different about these? And, um, and then to allow you to iterate on that. Like you might start with a latency issue and find out, well, it turns out that this dependency of mine has some queue that's exploding. That's not actually the root cause. That's just a new symptom that you need to investigate. So why is the queue exploding? You'd say, well, it's because one of our customers, API customers, increased their load by 5,000x in the last five minutes. And that's actually a legitimate root cause that you can go and work on, or maybe it's a deployment or a configuration change or a feature flag. But until you get back to something that's a human action, you haven't, or, or some kind of giant dependency that's broken, you haven't really figured it out. And if observability isn't focused on answering what changed, you'll be led down many false hypotheses of things that seem totally bizarre, but they're actually normal behavior. So um, I think the biggest concern I have is that people are still trying to claw themselves into a place where they can understand what's happening, but that's not enough. You need to understand what the, what the delta was across the change, and, and that's where observability needs to go, I think. Yeah, if I can, if I can chime in here, a lot of, some of the work we did at Netflix, uh, because we had a good, robust tracing system, was you know, what is steady state? Let's look at the dependency graph. Let's look at what we, our understanding of the system. Great. Now let's identify the things that we're concerned about and let's go break them or delay them. And then let's look at how that graph changes. And what that does is it reveals hidden redundancy within the system that was there, that was built to mitigate these issues, but that you may not have been aware of. And the simplest example of that is like a cache to a service to a database. Like those all fundamentally do the same things in transferring data, but you have different layers there. And if you're if you're running in happy state, you know, oh, your system has a cache, but you don't see anything beneath that because there's no need for it. Oh, but you have a cache miss. And I saw this, I saw some, some crazy cache misses because we rely on caches to scale. And when a cache goes down, the common, the common outage pattern I saw was the cache couldn't keep up, the cache miss rate drops, the service starts getting all of those backfill requests or the, the, the calling service starts calling the service directly, at which point the service gets overloaded or the database gets overloaded, can't keep up with traffic, falls over, and there's nothing to fulfill that need. That redundancy has been, been um, fully, fully utilized uh, throughout. So this idea of what does the system look like? And then <clears throat> the other thing is that, and, and, and if we're gonna, if, since you mentioned the SRE book, 
Um, one of the things I, I disagree with in the SRE book is the hypothetical situations. Um, our systems have so many hundreds of thousands of lines of code, whether it's the operating system or the network level, whether it's the routing and the VPNs, whether it's the security groups, whether it's the code we wrote, the other code running on our machine, the frameworks, the libraries we're using. And so sitting down and talking about what might go wrong to me is not a good use of time. Going and actually like this is this is there's almost like a quantum physics analogy. Like you, the only way to understand how the system behaves is to change it, is to modify it, and to see what that outcome is, and to see what the effect is. And there's a lot of ways to do that safely, but in my opinion, you must have good observability because otherwise you're flying blind. And there's no point in making changes if you're not going to be able to analyze the results. But then causing that and seeing what happens teaches you so much about how your system is put together and how all of the pieces interact that like without doing that like the kind of naive to like even that first step to me is such a big gap that and this is kind of the, the benefit of being on cutting edge technology and new spaces is people people here you know chaos engineering sometimes i think oh, chaos monkey like i can reboot some posts whatever but they're not thinking about this kind of deep experimentation and understanding that's allowing us to tune our circuit breakers or our timeouts or our fallbacks that allow us to understand the architectural decisions we've made and make us better engineers. Yeah, so I think along those lines, I mean, you say that like thinking of those hypothetical situations isn't really a good place to start. Uh, but what is, right? If we have these deep systems and they're complex and someone is thinking, well, I want to start in chaos engineering, uh, where do you start without starting with those fantastical hypotheses and, and trying to figure out these complex systems? You look, at, you look at your tracing and observability to understand. You yeah. know, I, you're right. I'm, I was a little unfair there. You have to, you do have to think through what could go wrong. And that's an exercise for the team and the company what are our risks? What are the likelihood? What, you know, past evidence is informative, but not necessarily going to tell you what's going to occur. And so you want to take it into account. Um, but, but that, so, so I think that's a good place to start. And those give you your high level buckets and items of things you're worried about, you know, region redundancy, a cache failing, and then, and then you go run the experiment and you know, whether you need to worry about it or not. And like the, the benefit there is that you're knocking things off your list <laughs> and you know, it, it's not all or none. Some things could creep back in or some things could happen in odd ways, but you're, you're mitigating risk and you're eliminating unknowns from your system. Yeah. I mean, I, I, uh, I said earlier that I, we're all, we're in the very early days for all of the stuff that we're talking about. And it does seem to me that um, if you run a system, in production, it should be possible to get a manifest of all of the assumptions your system is making. You know, um, it, it's not a difficult. Like you may not realize it, but the way that you've architected your call stack for this particular end-user-facing thing to happen, you're assuming that like these 14 internetwork connections are running with this latency. You're assuming that this Kafka instance is healthy. That sort of thing should be um, discoverable. And each one of those in my mind, um, it's not like a completely academic hypothesis testing thing like you're referring to in the SRE book, which I think it is, um, it feels Sisyphean to me to try and come up with a complete list just a priori without any data from production into what you should be testing. But good observability actually can help you um, find important, hypo important hypotheses you should test based on your current dependencies in the study state. Um, I, I have to say, um, to be clear, this is not something that I see in any product right now, including LifeStep, but uh, the thing that I would love to do is to, um, is to get to a point where our software understands the branches that are not being taken as well as ones that are being taken to understand your failure states um, a little bit better uh, than uh, we, we can right now with the telemetry we're getting out of our systems. I've seen things like that in the olden days, like in the 90s, where you're able to, um, the, the sort of tooling you're able to uh, inject into an application running on a single host 
these sorts of things actually were testable and it was pretty exciting what you could do with them. Um, we've lost some of that capability with the move to the cloud and, uh, and the way that we deploy services, but um, it'll be exciting to see that stuff come back. Because I think there are a lot of dependencies people only have during incidents that, that they're not aware of and, and getting those to, uh, to come out, which would, have, would require some amount of chaos engineering um, as well as a certain type of observability would be really exciting. Uh, and um, uh, especially when you have like your example of cache, cache hits misses, branches where both, both branches should give you the same result um, <laughs> but have very different performance and cost considerations. In my mind, the code should always take a little bit of both, back to your quantum analogy. You should always be executing both branches a little bit. And then that will give you a leg up in understanding um, what's just around the corner if you have a true failure of one branch or the other. And I'd like to see us get there as an industry. That was, um, that reminds me a bit of the nice thing of that application level approach we took at Netflix is you could do request level, you know, failure injection. And so we had some QA tests that were running in the background that were exercising some of those failure branches on a regular base, basis. Um, so I think, I think there's, there's a lot of importance. It's really, let's talk about how testing has changed. It's not the most exciting topic, but the world of, you know, three month cycles and an army of QA engineers, you know, hampering on something to get it perfect before we ship it out the door versus the world where we ship code every day or multiple times a day. And this is code that again, relies on all of these other distributed pieces that we cannot test or that we are not testing or that we view are not in our control, but maybe in our responsibility. And to me, like documenting the assumptions the system made in many regards, a good test plan documents a lot of the assumptions that the code has made. And so I see a lot of analogies when it comes to your production environment that the appropriate set of alerts and um, thresholds allow you to know that the system's kind of behaving as you would expect, but a, a, a set of these negative failure experiments that verify these edge cases. And the, you know, my panacea is when we've written those test cases and we're comfortable running them on a regular basis, not just in development and in staging, but in production, we have an early warning system, we have a canary system, we have a testing system that's alerting us to regressions in past assumptions we've made about our system. And I think that information, if nothing else, is incredibly valuable. Yeah, that's a great comment. I think it sort of segues into, there's a, a question that was submitted from Eric, uh, who submitted a, a bunch of questions, but one in particular was about, uh, does distributed tracing or observability help improve the transition uh, time between moving from a monolith to microservices. And you know we've already discussed velocity and all the reasons you'd want to move to microservices. So I'm curious if you, if Ben, if you want to answer that, how, how distributed tracing helps in that transition. But I wanted to extend his question even further since we've been talking about deep systems. How does distributed tracing not only maybe influence the time for transitioning from a monolith, but any advice on preventing it from going from a monolith, not only to microservices, but going too far, going to in a too, into a too deep of a system? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we've certainly, I mean, we being Lightstep have certainly seen a lot of organizations adopt our product, I guess, um, as observability and distributed tracing wrapped in one as part of their own migration to microservices. And despite a lot of our customer logos seeming very progressive, 100% of them still have a monolith somewhere as well. I mean, it's, it's very difficult to find an example of a company that truly has destroyed their monolith. Um, so um, I think it's really important, like very, very important to make that transition sane um, for the people operating the systems. And it goes back to a lot of these things about even um, getting a, a basic understanding of how your system fits together is it's impossible to expect your developers to keep that stuff up to date in a wiki or something like that. Like you absolutely need to have the system self-document and distributed tracing is the, is the raw data to make that possible. Um, distributed tracing is, uh, is really just a technology though, and, and I would argue mostly it's the description of the telemetry. The, the thing that, that the actual 
tooling, like the product, should be doing, I think goes back to what I said a minute ago. It should be about um, detecting changes and explaining them. Those can be changes between now and the past. It can be changes, you know, of course, uh, regarding an SLO. It can also be even changes within a single time slice. You could say, I want to compare the slow stuff to the rest and what's different about the slow requests as a group. And when you look at the, ironically, one of LightStep's informal product goals, it's not like an actual KPI, but, but we joke around about the, the, the better our product gets, the less people spend, um, the less time people spend looking at actual individual traces. They're mostly looking at insights that are drawn from many traces. So I would remind people to, to not just think about the raw data, which are these waterfall diagrams, but what sorts of insights can you actually gather from those that will help explain why your system isn't healthy right now um, or why adding this new service added a bunch of new tail latency and questions like that that are certainly instrumental if you want to have a successful migration. And then to take Jason's question, um, uh, we have seen, um, and, uh, I mean, just uh, collegially, I've talked to people where they've been at companies that have um, embraced services uh, uh, a little too hard. <laughs> the sort of anti-pattern I've heard is, is when services basically become copy on write, where you don't have the team continuing to own the service and they write the thing, they move on. And then when you want to change the behavior, the anti-pattern is to actually basically force the code base and create a new service that runs in parallel to the old one. It's just crazy time stuff, right? Um, uh, I think that, um, how should I say? I mean, no, no idiom or paradigm is immune to bad engineering when you can always make a mess of anything. Uh, and so at some level, I think it comes back to basic, uh, you know, human person management stuff about uh, ownership and accountability for code and, and making sure not to bite off more than you can chew. Um, I don't think that any sort of chaos engineering or observability will make a very poorly constructed distributed system reliable, um, but I think it can help shed some light on things that are performing very poorly and help an organization to self-correct before that pattern um, gets completely out of control. So I think the way I would see it is it's more a way to document bad patterns quickly in production and hopefully to, to correct that behavior um, organizationally. And, and I, I do think that chaos engineering and observability um, that's built on top of tracing um, can help identify those issues in deep systems uh, before they become problematic for, for sure. Yeah, I think uh, your answer to that also answered uh, one of Ivan's questions that was submitted about uh, thinking about constructing some sort of CMDB uh, to you know sort of document your systems. But it's nice the idea that distributed tracing really is live documentation, right? Being able to see how things connect. Ivan did have one other question though that was about the security in deep systems, and I know Colton, you and I have talked a bit about that because there's a nice sort of parallel between chaos engineering and, and security with, with pen testing. I'm curious if you want to comment about that, about how you view security in, in deep systems. I think the, the, the primary difference with security is, you know, you're facing the defender's dilemma. And so any, any entry point, any way in, you know, is, is what you're trying to prevent. It's more difficult than the reliability side where, you know, ideally people aren't building unreliable systems out of malice and they're, they're not going to benefit from that. And the domain of things that can go wrong generically is, is uh, more constrained. You know, if you're dealing with a world where you want to harden, you know, you assume that someone's on the inside already and you want to harden all the interactions between your system. To me, there's just, there's a lot of work that needs to go in to validate those assumptions and to ensure that you're aware of the gaps. And again, that, that defender's dilemma is you must find all the things because if you miss one, that can be the one. Um, so I don't envy the security world and I wish you good luck. Maybe Ben, maybe ben has a better answer. I'm not sure I'd say better. I mean, I have an additional answer to that. Um, security is a, you know, it's a huge topic, right? And there's a lot of different angles and what that even means. One thing I've seen come up uh, quite a bit um, with customers that have, have adopted deep systems is that you know, we've talked to them just in terms of product, you know, 
roadmap strategy type of stuff, and we've come up we've we've come up on the security topic a few times. The thing that's that's come up as a as a strong desire is to, we were talking earlier about discovering dependencies, or I didn't know I depended on that region, that sort of thing. Um, this is particularly important for certain types of security use cases, including some compliance use cases around um, where information should be allowed to flow and not flow. Um, distributed tracing can both be uh, thought of as an observability technology, but the underlying, um, the part that's difficult to deploy is context propagation, which is which is propagating some unique identifiers alongside the transaction itself as you go from service to service. And once you've sorted that out, which is something the Open Telemetry Project as well as the W3C Trace Context Project are doing, you can put metadata, it has to be small because it does get copied alongside your user data, your application data. But you can put metadata in there that can serve a pretty valuable purpose from a security standpoint. So you can say things like, you know, the, maybe you have, just hypothetically, let's say you run, um, I don't know, like a, 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 ride, a ride sharing service or something. You have drivers and riders. You might want to say, um, someone who's logged in as a rider should never be able to write to the driver database ever. And you should be able to enforce that type of constraint um, via this um, context propagation. That sort of future world is, is very realistic, but I think we need to see things like open telemetry and the trace context standard um, actually proliferate wall to wall within an application. And once they do, then the technical foundation is there to do some really science fiction security stuff um, at the application layer. And I think we're basically waiting for instrumentation to catch up to enable those sorts of applications. I'm very excited about them personally, but I think um, unlike observability where partial instrumentation is useful, partial instrumentation for security doesn't make a CISO very excited. So you need to have total coverage or nothing. So we're waiting for that to happen. And then I think a bunch of really exciting net new use cases will emerge probably in the next couple of years. Yeah, that's super exciting stuff. Well, we are right at the, uh, about at the top of the hour. So I, ooh, ooh, I, wanted, I wanted to make sure we got all the other Q and A, but I had, I had a, a tidbit I wanted to throw in on the cloud migration story. Yeah. Um, personally, I've seen a lot of teams, you know, do the lift and shift or pull out a piece of code and drop it. And again, to the discussion about testing, what I've observed is there's a period of pain that teams go through for the first couple of months while they relearn the bugs they'd fixed before, while they uncover the, the complexities of this new environment, while they learn how auto scaling works or, or how these different aspects of their system work. And to me, the cloud investment and migration is a huge bet that a lot of teams and companies are making to improve their speed of innovation and, and to be able to compete. But we, we as an industry could be doing such a better job mitigating that risk by testing for some of the things as we're going, as opposed to at the end. It's Ben's point about like no amount of chaos engineering or observability is gonna save you from bad architectural decisions you made early on. And the folks that wait to do it until they've gone through the couple of months of pain, in my opinion, are, are causing themselves pain that was unnecessary. That amortize small amounts of work upfront to help ensure that things are running smoothly building in your instrumentation from the beginning, as opposed to trying to wedge it in after the fact, making sure you're thinking about redundancy and reliability and these principles as you're building it and doing, you know, kind of like test-driven development. When you've got your, my system should be able to withstand these things up front and you're building alongside that, then you arrive at a world where your project is done on time, it shifts, it works, customers are happy, your boss doesn't yell at you, at where the converse that I've seen way too many times is just, we rush to get it out the door, this stuff could wait, and then you spend the next three months getting woken up in the middle of the night or dealing with your boss asking why this code is bad. Um, so I think, I think there's a lot of opportunity in, in, again, not just tooling, but practice and, and methodology and how we approach migrations. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Uh, well, we are at the top of the hour now. Thanks. I wanted to thank everyone for joining again. I, I know that everyone's busy. So the fact that you took time out of your day to join us uh, has been fantastic. Uh, before we go, uh, I have a few things. Um, there's uh, personally for me, lightstep.com slash observability. Uh, Lightstep has an ebook about observability that I think is fascinating. 
Um, so I'm going to post that link into the chat. Uh, so you can click on that to get that. They're also going to be sending out a follow-up email um, on the observer or the um, the distributed tracing book, which they published with O'Reilly. So there will be an opportunity to get that. From the Gremlin side, uh, ChaosConf, we haven't officially announced it, although there is a landing page up. We're about to uh, to send out the announcement on that. I can't tell you exactly when because I literally just got messaged from our events folks about potentially delaying that a, a tad. But anyway, we'd love to, to have you join us for ChaosConf, which is our annual conference about chaos engineering that'll be coming up this fall. So uh, hit that link, gremlin.com slash chaosconf for info on that. And then if you'd like to chat more about chaos engineering or just reliability in general, uh, Gremlin maintains uh, the chaos engineering Slack. It is a completely open Slack. So although we help maintain it, uh, we have people from all over the chaos engineering community on there. You can find more information on that uh, at gremlin.com slash community. With that, thank you all again for joining. And again, we've recorded this. So if there's any information you want to get back to, uh, we'll send out that information about the video. But thank you all for joining. Thank you. It was great. Appreciate, yeah, appreciate the time, Jason and Ben. Always a pleasure to chat yeah. and, and discuss. Uh, we got to do this more often. I know. Me too. All right. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.